Welcome, everybody. Let's talk about math. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a mathematician's view. That is my view of machine learning. And I'm going to hopefully convince you why it matters. So we just saw kernel machines. So this is great. I think of machine learning as something that takes inputs and translates them into outputs. So just to give a few examples to set the stage, I have my smartwatch here. It's constantly reading what's happening, my heart rate, whether or not I'm moving, my location, what the apps I'm using. And then it, I think it puts it through a machine learning model uh, to tell me, to, to make predictions about what I'm doing. So it could tell I was washing my hands earlier and gave me a little buzz when I'd washed them long enough. It detects when I'm working out or when I'm done working out and I forgot to turn it off. You can think of unsupervised situations. So maybe I just have a bunch of data about customers. What did they purchase? When did they purchase? Where did they purchase? What coupons did they use? If it's online, they can look at what was in the shopping basket and what got taken out. You can put that into a machine learning model and just sort of group the data into something like clusters. These often don't come with labels, but people often go back in later and sort of say, oh, maybe I can segment, segment my shoppers at the grocery store into people who are shopping for families and buying hot dogs, or people who are buying lots of wine. Um, and so these are sort of things you can do. And then there's, of course, many important applications for machine learning. So as one example is medical diagnostics. It has a lot of roles to play there. So we can think about imagery coming from various uh, measurement systems like MRI. We can think about uh, measurements that come from devices, but also from blood tests. We think about the genome and various medical histories. You could, in theory, put all those together. Most don't. And then you can put it through a machine learning model. And so I kind of give an image here of sort of maybe tumor detection in a brain, so trying to find regions of abnormalities. So many applications, we think of these as going from inputs to outputs. So as a mathematician, I think, oh, it's a function. So I have some set of inputs, which I think of a vector x. So it could be a list of d features. And I put that into this machine learning black box. And I get out some sort of answer, which I think of as an f of x. So here's my function. And I want to convince you that everything you're seeing is functions. I had kernels on there. We just saw kernels in the last talk. I took it out. Because I thought, oh, maybe doesn't everybody know kernels? But now you do, so too bad. But, uh, and these aren't just functions. They're actually parameterized functions. And so this is sort of the key for machine learning is you learn a bit about the function as you go. So you have some theta, which is learned during the training phase. And so that's, that's an important part as well. And so what are our functions? So I say theta as a generic term. Theta is something different for every sort of model. So we think of just the simplest thing of linear regression. So our function is just some weights multiplied times our input features, and then plus some bias term. And so those are the parameters. Those are the theta for linear regression. You can think about clustering. So we can think of the k-means algorithm as one of the major algorithms. You're finding the centers of the clusters. If you put in a new point, you could tell you which cluster center is closest to give you the index of the cluster it belongs in. You can do, how could I give a talk about machine learning without mentioning deep learning? So we have our deep neural network. At each stage, we have, at each level of the network, we have weights. What's the weight going from a node at level i to a node at level i plus 1? And then the biases, and you put that through an activation function. And this is super cool because it's a composition of functions, so super fancy for us mathematicians. And so you do that same process at every level with different weights and biases. And so mathematicians like to think a lot about functions and their general properties. So what are mathy questions people might ask about machine learning models? So we think we have some input that's in a domain, a subdomain of d-dimensional space. We often assume there's some true mapping that we just get to see hints of. So some oracle that's actually the f star is what we're trying to find in our machine learning model. And we also get training data. So in the unsupervised case, we just get a set of points, x sub i's. And then in the supervised case, we get some set of labels. But these labels aren't always exactly what the oracle would tell us. It's usually a noisy version of what we see. So you also have to deal with that. And then we are trying often to learn a model that's inside a larger family of models. So we're going to try and learn a deep learning model. We're going to try to learn a regression model or a random forest model. So we have families of models, and then we try to learn a function from within that family. So we can ask questions. If I 
How well can a function in a given family learn an arbitrary function? Maybe I even know a little bit about F star. So can I say how well we can approximate this F star with a deep learning model versus a random forest model? How many samples do we need to build a good model? Uh, what if we have noise in our labels? How does that affect the answers? Are there certain families of models? I think we all spend a lot of time thinking, what models should I use that have advantages in my context? Is some one more flexible? Is another more parsimonious? Are some more computable than another? And then how does the model complexity impact generalization? So you might think of this just the number of parameters of a model. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then also, how can we just learn the parameters of a model? If I have, a, I can make, write down any math model I want, but how can I learn that theta for that model? We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So, and I should say, I could talk about all those topics, or I would like to, but then everybody would fall asleep, because I can make a room go silent with my love of mathematics. <laughs> um, so how does model complexity, so the number of parameters is maybe the best way to think of it, impact generalization? And can this, we sort of uh, explain mathematically the power of deep learning? So this is inspire, or so it's highly complex models. So I kind of gave myself away. So we're gonna try to fit an ML model. And so what are you normally learn? So you don't wanna underfit. So I wanna separate here the red circles and the blue crosses. So if I just draw a straight line, I don't get a very good separation. So that's underfit. I could draw a really complex line and then I could overfit this model. But normally we're taught we want to get like sort of happy medium. So we fit most of the data, but not all of it. And so you see this in this sort of classic trade-off curve where we have error or risk on the y-axis and model complexity or number of parameters on the x-axis. And then if you train a more and more complex model, you can eventually derive your error on the data that you get to see, your training error, to zero. And normally the zero point is basically where the number of parameters is equal to the number of data points, loosely speaking. And then if you look at what happens with the testing data, this is data that your model has not seen, it gets better and better in terms of the error and then it starts getting worse again. And so that's, you know, we all know that's like how it is. But then people started to ask, math people started to ask, what if you keep adding more parameters? This, sort of, this is craziness. What if you kept adding more parameters it actually can improve beyond what you saw originally. So it can actually get a lower error than if you sort of stopped at this happy medium. And actually, if you stare at this overfit picture, I think that's a pretty good fit. It's a pretty smooth line between those X's and O's, and you could sort of argue that that, that could be good. And so this was something that's seen a lot in deep learning, is that using way, way too many parameters, a ridiculous number, can actually be better. And there's a lot of mathematical thoughts about this, and so there's this paper that came out in the Proceedings of National Academy by Misha Belkin, Daniel Su, and uh, Ma and Mandal that really sort of opened the door and sort of took a mathematical approach at looking at this and sort of began to highlight that this happens not just in deep learning. So one question was, why is deep learning so good? But maybe there are other models that can be equally good. This also happens in random forests. It even happens in regression. And so there's a nice paper in a journal that I'm actually editor-in-chief of and helped to found called the Siam Journal on Math of Data Science, which even looks at this phenomena of adding too many parameters, even in the context of regression, and sort of looks at trade-offs of different ways of doing that. And um, so there's many ways that you can look at this. And so mathematics sort of asks this question of why does it work and come up with some answers. And oh, I should say one of the answers is that the models tend to get smoother as you add more and more parameters. So it takes out those high kinkiness and becomes smoother, and that's sort of the, th the basic thought of why these are starting to work better. And then I'll also talk a little about some work that I've been involved with, is how can we find the parameters of a model? And in particular, can modern mathematics open new avenues? So deep learning sort of became repopularized. It had been around for a long time, this idea of neural networks when we learned how to fit models more efficiently with mathematics and also more data. So can we apply that in other regimes? So let's look at the problem of data clustering, which has applications in things like density estimation and anomaly detection. And so here, one popular model is something called Gaussian mixture model or soft clustering. You can find this in every sort of package out there to do uh, clustering. And so, you want to find some model. It has a bunch of parameters. I'm not going to go into the details here. 
But you're basically trying to find these hills that describe your data. So the top of each peak is the center of a cluster, and then it sort of falls off from there. And it's soft clustering, because any given point, you can say what's its closest peak, what's its next closest peak, and so on. So that's what we're trying to find. The standard method to fit this type of model is something called likelihood maximization, and usually you use the expectation uh, maximization algor uh, algorithm. So we can look at a different way to fit that. So another way that people used in 1D a lot was something called method of moments. And so what's the idea there? So remember, there's this weird property of a random variable, at least it's very weird to me, that the expected value of the random variable x squared is not the same as taking the mean of the random variable and then squaring it. And so the idea behind the method of moments is you look at what all these things do, the x, the x squared, the x cubed, and then I put this funny x circle two, which is what you do with the random with uh, multidimensional variables. So this example I showed just has two variables. Suppose you want to do the third moment of a model with two variables. What would you be looking at? Would, you'd be looking at the expectation of x1, the expectation of x2, the expectation of x1 squared, the expectation of x1 times x2, the expectation of x2 squared, the expectation of x1 cubed, the expectation of x1 times x2 squared, of x2, x1 squared times x2, and x2 cubed. That's just two variables in the third moment. We want to do this for tens, hundreds, thousands of variables, and then fourth, fifth, sixth order moments. And I'll tell you, we can now do this. And so, and the reason that this is interesting is you think this is like polynomial functions of your variables, those might actually be very interesting in understanding what to do with your features, because you, you don't always have the raw features that you want. Sometimes you need derived features. And this, you can take data and then build a model and try to match these moments. So that's what the goal is with moment matching. And so I'm involved with the paper that just came out, and so this is our visualization of how to compute the third order moment of a Gaussian mixture model. I don't expect that to make sense. It's just a teaser if that picture looks interesting to you of sort of an outer product of a vector and a matrix on that right-hand side, and you symmetrize it. It's very a fancy mathematics. And so that paper is just posted on Archive recently, and I encourage you to go check it out. What I hope I'm starting to convince you of is the important role of mathematics in machine learning, especially for addressing the challenges of machine learning. So, so many challenges that are, we've heard about today, robustness and generalization, bias in many places in the models, in the training, in the definitional loss functions, of course, also in the data, model approximation properties, numerical accuracy, computational efficiencies, um, uncertainty estimation. You know, a lot of times when you get the probability that some classification is true, there's a very ad hoc measure. That they've, that they've given you. It's not really based in a lot of firm statistics. I also want to mention that a lot of things are thought if we just get more data, if we just get a bigger model, we can now answer that question. And I think math has a lot to say that maybe that will actually be impossible in some cases. That it's not always a matter of just more data and just bigger models. And it's important to know when you can do that. And then you can also think about feature sensitivity importance and much, much more. And then some of the areas of math, of course, people get trained in, in data science programs, linear algebra, numerical optimization, statistics. But there's many more areas that could potentially be relevant. The paper I just talked about, I was involving co uh, colleagues from, ab uh, from uh, uh, abstract geometry. And we use things like Bell polynomials and enumerative combinatorics. So really interesting topics. And there's a broad, uh, many topics of math that will be relevant to data science. So thank you. And I'd love to connect.